So um, this um, kind of alarming photo is of, of what I would consider the poster child for last summer, right? You remember what it was like. And uh, yeah, it's, and uh, conceivably this is uh, the equivalent for this summer, right? <laughs> And um, so, you know, the, the, the climate it changes, and that's um, it's kind of job security as far as I'm concerned, just there's a, this variability. And so what we're actually going to cover today is um, uh, the climate from a, a perspective of extreme events. It's one thing, you know, temperatures going up a few degrees, you know, whatever. What really matters, are we going to have heat waves like we had last summer that much more often? Are we going to have a lack of cold snaps and, you know, cold snaps with their mixed blessing, right? Um, and so we're going to kind of do a little bit of a survey here going through the next oh, 45 minutes or so. What I'd kind of like to do, and, um, as Bill suggested, is um, not just have this a monologue, but please feel free to stop me at any time for clarification comments, uh, complaints, or whatever. And so let's, uh, you know, uh, we don't have to wait till the very end. I'm um, not a very formal individual. You know, look at me. All right. uh, and, and so uh, I am gonna concentrate a little bit on what happened last summer because it was such a big deal. And I think from your perspective, it probably had a lot of impacts that are probably still being um, it's still playing out. We're going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the data and then um, kind of um, not too much, but what our climate models are projecting for the future from uh, in both the mean sense and from a kind of an extreme event perspective. And um, all of this, so while I'm thinking of it now, I want to mention it in case I forget at the end, is that the climate office really wants to work more with the conservation districts. How many of you uh, have uh, relationships past or present with the climate impacts group at the University of Washington? A few of you probably do. We're if not exactly joined at the hip with the climate impacts group, we're probably going to be um, part, become part of that organization now we're technically a little bit separate but we're um, we'd like to work more with you and we don't know what your issues are and we need to know those and we can we I think we can help you out in, um, in providing climate information or whatever um, so the heat wave of 2021 I'll try to move around so I'm out of the, the <laughs> camera. And, and some of the um, yeah, so I, I don't know how many of these uh, elements you've checked off here from this, you know, B movie from the 50s and so forth. But um, yeah, it was uh, obviously a pretty big deal. And uh, just to illustrate that, uh, two time series here, one, the top one, SeaTac Airport, the bottom one, Spokane International and it runs from the, uh, the 1st of June through the end of August. Those blue bars show the temperatures each day, the kind of brown diaper gravy sort of band in the middle is the normal range of temperatures at those two locations. And then the red and kind of blue traces at the top and bottom, uh, all time records for that day. And clearly set all kinds of records at um, the SeaTac just uh, shattered the previous record for a high temperature. Spokane just tied it. Oh, didn't, you know, maybe that was a disappointment, but there were plenty of places across the state that set all time records. One thing I'd like to point out too is um, here if you direct your attention to that Spokane trace at the bottom, notice how for, um, there was a big heat wave at the end of June, but it stayed hot, especially in Eastern Washington. And I don't need to tell you guys this um, for much of July, and in particular, those minimum temperatures were consistently above normal. And um, this is um, something I'm going to, you know, hit, hit on more. Just how what we're seeing in the minimum temperatures, the nighttime temperatures. All right. 
Um, not going to go into a lot of detail about what the weather pattern was with it. You've heard the term heat dome has kind of come up like polar vortex. Ah, question in the back. Good. Why are most uh, temperatures taken at airports? Well, the airports, they have very high quality instrumentation. Um, and it is in many cases, um, it's a kind of a, uh, just an indicator that it's used. Um, it's probably more representative of the kind of urban settings than the rural settings. And in particular, um, SeaTac Airport, we know is, um, it's not a pristine location. Um, and so from that regard, maybe you'd pick something else. And certainly in the climate business, we consider elsewhere, but, um, when uh, you know people say, "What's the temperature at Seattle?" What the Weather Service forecast is is trying to hit what the temperature is going to be at the airport. So it's not, you know, the the only spots we care about, or even the most Im important spots necessarily, but they're kind of index um, stations. So um, what I show here, the heat dome, this concept of this um, high pressure loft. And that caused sinking motion that um, made for that sinking air compresses, gets that much warmer, and that reinforces that high aloft. There was nothing special in terms of the overall pattern um, for the heat wave in 2021. It was like ones in the past. It was just that much more extreme. And uh, one thing, uh, getting back to this uh, thing that I warned you about just a minute ago or so, is that what we're really seeing and what I'm personally more alarmed by is what the trends are in these nighttime, especially in summer versus the daytime temperatures. These two plots here show just uh, the vertical axis there shows the day of the year, maybe not so important, but um, what is on the horizontal there is when the really big daytime um, heat events were. Uh, west of the Cascades, it turns out, in um, Washington and Oregon, uh, going back to 1900. And on the right is uh, the nighttime events, the hot night ones, that have actually bigger impacts from a human health perspective than from many environmental perspectives. And what we can see is the daytime events have been sprinkled over the, his, uh, the last century or so. They're not getting any more frequent, but the nighttime ones are. And for what it's worth, uh, this study was about 10 years ago. Uh, we're um, kind of updating it, looking not just west of the Cascades, but also east of the Cascades. And so, you know, stay tuned for that or whatever we say. All right. So with the big heat wave we had in last summer, where was it the hottest? Where do you see the magenta colors here that kind of purple, that's where it got the very hottest. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, kind of an interesting sort of pattern there, really hot in the Northern Willamette Valley for what it's worth. So, um, Portland got to 116, well, um, which is typically, you know, not that much different from Seattle, let's say. In Washington state, it was the lower Columbia Basin that got the very hottest, but there was also some really severe heat up in the Okanagan there. And um, we've seen around Chief Joseph Dam, that is a hot spot. And I'm not sure, well, yeah, terrain certainly has a lot to do with it, but it, it shows up here. So yeah, it, it, this just shows during that 30 day period what the hottest temperature was. And um, here again, broken record, uh, I talk about minimum temperatures here. I'm, what this map is showing is the departure from normal, where the normal is for the period of 91 through 2020 for that 30 day period as a whole. So the hotter the color or the darker red, the greatest departure from normal, even in the recent normal. And you can see that um, from a climate perspective, that late June into through much of July was extraordinary with nighttime temperatures averaging like eight degrees above normal. That 
that's a big deal. Uh, what is an all-time uh, high temperature record set in Washington State during our heat wave? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yes, no, who cares? But no, I see some nodding heads. Yes, in, in fact, on the Hanford Reservation, we got to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, broke uh, the previous record of 118. And so this just shows a bunch of, you can't see, but just a bunch of uh, temperatures, the 100 plus teens um, there in uh, southeastern Washington. And um, what I think is kind of remarkable also is what's, what occurred with that at the same time. These are dew point temperatures, the higher the dew point, the higher the humidity. And um, again, those of you in the back row who don't have a chance of seeing this, but the irrigated parts of Eastern Washington had a considerably higher dew points than the non-irrigated sections. And it turns out from the point of view, um, there's a parameter called the wet bulb globe temperature that takes into account air temperature, relative humidity, how windy it is, how sunny it is, and so forth, to what is uh, the kind of the stress on humans. It turns out that it, it was a little cooler in the irrigated spots, but because it was more moist, that wet bulb globe temperature was that much higher there, and it was in the severe category as far as OSHA is concerned. And they recommend that people doing moderate activity, like outdoor workers, construction, agricultural workers, can only work 15 minutes out of the hour. And um, I'm actually stunned we didn't have more um, uh, with that a community than we did. There were a lot of fatalities in the Pacific Northwest, um, hundreds, but uh, there was a farm worker that had certainly died in Oregon. I think there was, uh, it's been implicated in another fatality that was in Washington State. And so this is, um, yeah, this is um, a big deal. And so just if you're thinking about, you know, from a hazard point of view, it's not just the heat, it's the humidity of, you know, cliche and all that. All right, a little bit more about this heat wave. Um, this is kind of a busy slide. I, you know, if I knew or I had my wits about me, I'd just skip it. But I, I basically, there's a, a group that um, very shortly after the event looked at it from an extreme value kind of perspective, the statistics and that sort of thing. And just what was the role in climate change in uh, this heat wave? And that, what they showed was that there is a relationship, it's not tight, but in that lower left corner, which shown a plot that a relationship between overall globe and how the most intense heat waves in the Pacific Northwest. And because the background heating of the climate it made an extreme event like we suffered through last summer that much more likely. And again, uh, another slide breaking all the rules, I just lifted it from this, this paper, um, is that uh, and just the point there is that it was that much more intense and that much more likely to happen because of that background global warming. And what is really sobering is what I've circled there at the bottom there that with warming that is already baked into the system with what we've done to, in terms of fossil fuel combustion, greenhouse gas emissions. In a couple of decades, it looks like heat waves of that intensity that come along every five or 10 years, rather than being just this, holy crap, you know, where did that come from sort of event. And so that, you know, that, that I think is very sobering. Another thing that, you know, is kind of related to that, and I'm going to concentrate on water during part of this talk because, you know, water is life, right? And especially in much of the West, some real hardships with uh, scarcity of water, that uh, partly what set the stage for that big heat wave was how dry it was in the spring and early summer of 2021. And the landscape was all dried out. And so when the, the 
conditions were right or just wrong, however you look at it, sun beating down and the really warm air mass, that energy from the sun was going into warming the ground and eventually the air that was in contact with, rather than as much of that energy going into evaporating water from the ground and transpiring from the vegetation. So this has been shown, this link between um, pre-existing dry conditions and that much hotter temperatures, especially in Europe, but it seems to be happening around here too. Thankfully, it's pretty wet out there right now. So we're not facing that same sort of stacking of the deck that we had last year, thankfully. Um, and uh, I, I'm gonna, there's gonna be a, quite a bit more about, you know, rainfall, stream flow and that sort of thing. But here are just um, uh, one of the things that I've been impressed by recently is kind of the whipsaw that we've had in terms of water, you know, too little at times and too much at times. You know, and you can test in the Skagit and uh, Nooksack yeah. in November. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to remind you of that. And, and just what I'm showing in this trace, in this black trace for the stream flow for all the rivers in that, you know, count in Washington State kept track of. Um, coming out of uh, the winter last year uh, on the left part of this, um, of this, maybe I can well, actually, oh. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to bother trying to use another little mousey there. But just um, uh, we had decent stream flows, but then we got the really dry, warm conditions of spring last year. The um, stream flows went into the toilet. I think that's the only way to describe that. That downward track, you know, over the course of last summer to where it's near record lows uh, before the, the rains came back last fall. And then look at it just shoot up into record territory there in November. So this is something we're liable to see more of. These are these big swings between our um, historically dry summers and wet winters. That, um, that difference is gonna be even exaggerating the future overall. And then what you can see at the very end of that trace, the uh, black trace there, how our wet spring of 2022 has really um, increased the flows. All right, a um, little bit more data on just what's what's happening here. This is um, from a paper, you know, obviously published some time ago, but I, I think it gives a nice perspective about um, the kind of place-to-place -place variability in what we're seeing in temperature trends. As you go from left to right, this is for different seasons, winter, DJF, December through February, March through May, spring, summer, and fall. And again, it's separating out max temperatures and min temperatures. Red dots show where it's warming over this 90 plus year period. Uh, the redder the dot, the greater the warming. And you can see there's some seasonal structure there. And also you see, you know, redder dots in the minimum temperatures and the maximum temperatures. If not, I encourage you to you know, make an appointment with your optometrist or something. But yeah, it, it is warming up more at night and uh, the different seasons a little bit more than others. And there are a few little blue dots, like blue dots, just for a fluke, whatever reason, there are places that haven't, um, over this period at least, warmed up. And I guess if you're a climate change skeptic, you can, you know, latch on that and say, see, you know, it didn't warm up. And it's like, well, there's a lot more red dots. That's what he said. Right. So another perspective here, just looking at the state as a whole. Again, I like to uh, contrast maximum temperatures. They're important, no question about it. And uh, this uh, time series goes back to the 1890s. Um, there's a line that's fit to it. There's a lot of year to year and even multi-year variability, hot periods cooler periods and so forth, an upward trend, but I'm struck by the, you know, the noise in the, this kind of the versus the signal, which is undoubtedly there. Contrast that with the minimum temperature trace. Here, it's not just that the rise is greater, but that just that signal to noise ratio is that much stronger here at minimum temperatures. And um, with 
last summer setting the record. Woohoo, yeah, uh, we're number one or something. Uh, um, going along with that is it's getting a little more humid here in terms of the atmosphere. Uh, humidity, it's not really, the relative humidity isn't going up, but as the temperatures go up and about the same relative humidity, the actual water vapor contents in the air have increased. This series, we have good data going back to after World War II. And um, again, the, the trend is unmistakable there. All right. Over time. Okay. Here, you know, there's an upward trend, but I'm more struck again by the variability in the system. And that um, the idea that if you to really see these trends emerge out of the background noise, um, you have to wait a while. And the, the, mess, the important message there is that there is considerable natural variability in the system. The winter coming up, we may have another really cold one, kind of like in uh, the end of 2019, it could well happen. And it doesn't mean that, you know, everything I'm talking about is BS, um, but, you know, that's, that's just part of the system. I encourage you to make use of this uh, really slick application. I kind of pat myself on the back in that sort of, uh, the, um, the climate office put together so you can look at what's happening in your neck of the woods. And uh, there is a URL at the bottom, but if you just go, go to Google on the Washington State Climate Office and follow your nose, it's easy to get to. But you can look at for different times of years, for different windows, you can look at what the trends are in the temperatures, and you can look separately at average temperatures, maximum temperatures, minimum temperatures, precipitation, and so forth, and um, get an idea for yourself what your, again, your region, your county, whatever, has experienced over the, you know, uh, the interval of interest. All right, um, a few things I want to talk about, getting back to extreme events here, is um, just what some of the data is showing um, for reasons that, mostly because I think it's a cool name. I, I, here I picked Ritzville as representative of um, Eastern Washington in the kind of state almost. And uh, this blue trace and red trace um, collectively shows the number of days in which you have either a really cold nights, the, the blue trace when it gets below 15, how many there are each winter, versus uh, the red trace is how many nights never get below 60. And um, the message here is, yeah, th there's fewer of those cold nights than there used to be. Here at Ritzville, it's hard to say you know, having that many more hot summer nights but at Olympia that I picked intentionally and uh, the gentleman in the back, you know, why are we using these airports and so forth? But actually it turns out Olympia Airport is out in the sticks away from the urban core of Puget Sound, very representative of the kind of more rural part of Western Washington. In this case, both the number of cold nights in winter is going down and the number of hot nights in the, in the summer is going up there. And so it's um, a little bit different um, sort of time series than Britsville. But again, um, if you're kind of interested in this kind of data for, you know, a spot, um, you know, uh, right in your backyard, please contact the office and we can, you know, get you this kind of information or you, whatever threshold you might be interested in. Um, number of hot days, you know, again, let's not ignore the maximum temperatures. Here, here I picked a Diablo Dam um, on the Skagit in part because of the name again, nobody knows they're Spanish, right? And so um, that's the blue trace there and counting up just the number of days each summer that it hit 90 plus degrees Fahrenheit, kind of going up. Spokane, yeah, maybe. Um, you, you know, we rarely have summers in which it never gets to 95 is kind of the, the threshold that I picked there. 
but it just shows the kind of, um, oh, you know, not one size, one size does not fit all in this climate data. And that's especially the case with the coldest temperature of the year, the very coldest minimum temperature. Um, again, from, uh, I picked Olympia, it's um, because of a more representative uh, kind of a rural area. And there um, maybe the, the potential for getting a really cold day has gone down, but it, you can still get into the single digits in, in Olympia. At Spokane, maybe there's not as uh, many years, the frequency of years with the really cold minimum temperatures isn't as high, but it can still really get cold there, obviously. And I wouldn't put too much into the last few years there, that might be a fluke. And so just the, the chances of having a really cold temperature in the winters now is less than it used to be, but it can still get almost as cold as it used to routinely. Snowfall, wow. You know, that's a shotgun blast, right? We don't see any trends there in, at Spokane. I, if you see one, you're you know, got a better eye than I. But um, yeah, so there you go. All right, but let's get back to water. Water is life. You know, again, in the West, it's a big deal. Mark Twain supposedly said, um, uh, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over, right? Yeah, who knows if Mark Twain actually said that. But um, anyway, let's just look at this time series from the period, take a Northwest perspective. So Idaho, Western Montana, Washington State, Oregon, the whole, if you look at the time series going back to 1895, no real trends in the annual amount of precipitation over this large area. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, let's look, uh, narrow down into just a region, a climate division right along the west slopes of the Cascades, where we have, you know, floods, sometimes severe floods from time to time. And even there, you yeah, know, maybe it's going up, but um, again, it just restricting to that flood season, November through January, yeah. in the data, not really showing up in terms of the, um, you know, the overall precipitation. What is showing up, of course, and you know, I don't need to, uh, nobody's gonna kill over a surprise here, is the end of season snowpack across the Pacific Northwest and Washington State. And so what's, again, with our handy dandy trend tool, we have some data where you can look for yourself what uh, where those trends are, where these brown, big brown dots are, or where there are statistically significant downward trends in the amount of water in the snowpack bank at the end of winter, typically considered April 1. This year, maybe winter didn't end on April 1, but that's another story. Um, there uh, in the North Cascades, uh, if you click on one of these dots, it brings up a time series. I just do a beaver pass in a place of 4,000 feet or so in the North Cascades. And so you can explore for yourself. And what you'll see is that it's especially those kind of moderate elevation spots that are seeing the biggest changes. Really high elevations is still cold enough to be mostly snow. And so it builds up a decent snowpack. It's those places. Uh, 3,000 feet, 4,000 feet that are kind of marginal and sometimes get rain, they're getting a greater proportion of rain. All right, how's that play out on our rivers, our streams? There, yeah, again, um, one size does not fit all because we have different kinds of streams. We have ones of low elevation that are almost all rain fed, like in this case, um, in the lower left, the Chehalis River. It's got some part of its watershed is higher up there, but it's mostly a rain fed stream. The Samish River up in Northwest Washington is another example of that. There are rivers like the upper left one, the Stillaguamish, that get both winter floods and they have a lot of snow in their upper reaches. And so they get a second pulse of milk water in the spring. And then we have rivers like, in this case, the Okanagan, the Sauk is another one that are snow dominant. 
And what we're seeing in terms of the, the magnitude of the floods in these different spots is different. And in particularly these mixed rivers like the Stille are the ones where they're getting more rain uh, in proportion to snow than they used to in the past. And uh, some of those rainstorms are that much more intense. And so there's definitely an upward trend in the, uh, the kind of potential for the maximum flood each year. And the, these single dots are showing what the, the highest flow was, the daily flow um, for each of those seasons. So that's where we're seeing bigger floods. Uh, it seems like in these rain dominant rivers, maybe there's some tendency Maybe not so much, but on the snow dominant ones, the flooding is overall getting a little bit less. And um, in that, if it is not as much snow when you have in the winter time, then you're not, when the spring melt happens in a big way, then it's not going to be as uh, severe as it has. But you can still have big years. That dot there on the, on the far right of the one for the Okanagan, that's 2019. And there was, for folks who were living around there, there was some major problems with flooding there. And so it can still happen, but it's just overall, that's, uh, we're seeing different trends there than elsewhere. And let's go back to the nightmare that was the, the winter of 1415. And, um, you know, uh, near normal precipitation, but uh, the warmest winter we've had on record, terrible snowpack, worst ever. And we definitely saw that in our streams. As, uh, here's an example of the South Fork and the Nooksack, where that those gold little dots show the average temperatures there over the course of January through October. And the uh, blue trace there, this is again uh, 2015, shows what the actual temperatures were there with uh, flows going low and warm a lot earlier than in the season than usual. And of course that did the number on uh, a lot of the uh, salmonids and, and trout and so forth. We actually had record returns you know, for some species, some groups, uh, stocks, I should say, coming into the Columbia in 2015, but a lot of them, especially the sockeye that are trying to get back to their hatcheries and uh, ha um, spawning grounds at the, you know, a hot time of year, it didn't make it. You know, this is an example from um, at the White Salmon River uh, tributary for the Columbia. Uh, and one thing, uh, you know, I showed some uh, a trace there that um, precipitation overall for the year as a whole isn't really changing too much. In winter, uh, you know, in the places of flood prone places, maybe not really changing that much. One thing that I'm really getting concerned about is what we're seeing in the summertime. This is for the state as a whole for the months of June through August. And I just circled the last 30 years or so. That may turn around. We had a wet um, year there. I think it was 2012 or something, a kind of a wet summer. This one may end up being that way. The weather we're having that had the last couple of months isn't guaranteed to continue into summer, mind you. But this overall trend with the idea that as the landscape dries out, then you know, there's obviously could be water scarcity problems, but it can get that much hotter too um, when there's not that water to evaporate. Look at the number of rainy days. Boy, here's another example. I don't really see any change, maybe a some increase at SeaTac, but Spokane, the record goes back over 100 years. Um, there, I would call a rainy day a half an inch. There doesn't seem to be that many more of them, if any. Maybe on the west side, they're going up some. Uh, there'll be a little bit more about that in a minute or two. Okay, so want to just briefly shift gears here um, about kind of storminess and winds. And I just, this is an example of me making stuff up. Um, and I need your help. Does this count? Do you care 
how often it is windy. Because um, that this is uh, some of the climate data that hasn't gotten enough attention, and it's kind of a, a pain in the rear to get a hold of that, but uh, perhaps we can help out here. And what I've just shown here is a number, number of hours for various places across the state. Hoquiam, the blue trace, gets you know um, windy more than 29 miles an hour uh, more often than other spots. Um, SeaTac is down there in the basement not a windy spot, and then a couple of spots, um, Pasco in the gray and Spokane there in the kind of yellowish color. Uh, you know, are there any sort of trends here? Can you tell me? Uh, one thing that's kind of, you gotta be careful about is the instrument instrumentation <laughs> has changed. The reporting practices have changed. And, um, and in particular, right around 2000 is when that happened. And there seems to be some, some things that have changed around then. Can also look at gust speeds, maybe rather than the mean winds, it's the maximum gust that's gonna bring down the tree limb or, or whatever. And there, we're seeing actually some trends toward more hours with these really strong wind gusts. And so I think this is interesting. And again, um, if you're interested in some of this data, I could, I bet I could get it for you. Yeah. Great point. I, I just look throughout the year, and if it matters more in the summertime, or especially in the fall, if the trees are still in leaf and they're better sales and tend to fall down more in the Spokane area, we've definitely seen that early season storms do more damage than late season one. And I see other places in the country. So it can be parsed out in that way. Um, all right. So anyway, that's an open question. Now, you know, not all of the state, let's say, is obviously is uh, next to the ocean, but uh, plenty of it is. And um, sea level is rising, right? You know, stop the presses. Okay. Uh, here are the, um, just from the tight gauge in um, Seattle, going back to the 1900, the upward trend with El Nino events kind of superimposed on it is, is pretty, um, pretty much there. Thanks to some work that was done by Washington Sea Grant, working with the Climate Impacts Group, they did a very nice report about the prospects for sea level over the next decades and so forth. And there, um, as many of you probably know, we're still recovering from the ice age from a geological point of view. There's parts of the, the state that are still uh, rebounding from the weight of the glaciers. And so on this, uh, this little map on the left, those red areas are where the land is rising, still we're kind of recovering from having this big heavy ice sheet on it. Other parts by are actually subsiding that much more than they otherwise would be. And so, you know, kind of one size doesn't fit all, but the, as part of this report, and you can go in and select your location, they have some very um, important information on what the kind of range of sea levels we're liable to see into the future, uh, in the future, whether you go with this um, uh, kind of more extreme climate scenario, the kind of worst case one, the 8.5 one in this, um, in this parlance, or the more optimistic one, the 4.5 one. And so you can see there, you know, what, what might be able to, uh, might be anticipated. And uh, one of the messages is that over the next couple of decades, it kind of doesn't matter what scenario we are along as a global society, and that a lot of these changes are already baked into the system, pun intended. Um, and then on uh, this last little note here is the elephant in the room is a Cascadia subduction earthquake. If we get one of those, all bets are off. And, um, and so, you know, to have the, uh, the land elevation drop, you know, multiple feet, there, there's parts of the state that would really uh, badly damage. 
Harbor Island in Seattle, where all the shipping comes in, the big docks there. That's basically the spoils from the Denny Hill dredging, or, um, and that's not very far above sea level. Few more things, and then I, you know, you guys have been too polite. I don't want to have a discussion here. We might remember the blob, right? The warm temperatures off the coast here, and in particular, what that that did. One of the big things was all the harmful algal blooms, um, um, basically unprecedented geographic extent and severity and duration and all the implications there were for commercial and recreational fisheries and so forth. And um, uh, I'll, I'll get to that when we get into the climate change thing in just a minute or two. Another thing that I'm sure you guys uh, think about all the time is wildfires. And here are these two traces. Um, what I could get my grubby mitts on easily just goes back about 20 years or so. The red trace is the number of fires. People are stupid, right? Most of them are actually human causes. So certainly when there are big lightning outbreaks, that's a problem and so forth. But we don't have that many more fires than we used to. We've always been stupid, right? Um, but the acres burn, the, uh, the kind of the traces kind of more brownish there, that definitely is on the rise here over the last 20 years, and especially with 2015 being the, um, the record here and uh, 2020 uh, being no slouch itself. We're seeing greater smoke amounts, especially in the Puget Sound Basin, where it, it used to just not be a problem. Um, people in Seattle, they whine about, oh, it's so smoky. And, you know, if you live in Leavenworth, in um, Omac, Spokane, you know, Ponderé County, yeah, yeah, you know all about this. And in turn, it's uh, this trait um, series only goes back to about a decade or so. But in Spokane itself, on uh, those values during the summertime are inching up. On the other hand, there are some success stories. I don't want to be just Debbie Downer here. In, uh, in particular in uh, the Puget Sound Basin, there's a lot more people than there used to be, but in the winter, air quality is a lot better. People aren't just burning their wood in their fireplaces just for the hell of it. The, uh, the really dirty old uh, wood stoves have been phased out. They heat the burn vans better. And that's a, this is a real public health success story. Average um, PM 2.5 concentrations are less than half what they were um, just uh, 30 years ago or so, even though there's a lot more people in the Puget Sound base. So um, I don't know, look for encouragement, right? Yeah. In terms of another pollutant that doesn't get a lot of attention around here, but maybe should is ozone. And especially if you're a forester, you actually act, uh, care about ozone because it can, um, it can do a number on the trees. It can uh, affect their health and not just uh, human health too. It's a very reactive molecule. And if you get it into your lungs, it can damage tissue and so forth. What happens, the, the, the big problems in Washington state is that kind of precursor chemicals are, made, uh, are produced in the urban areas in Puget Sound. That witch's broom is acted on in hot temperatures in the sunshine and blows up into the foothills of the Cascades. And that's where the high ozone is. And so what this trace here shows corresponds to maximum temperatures at SeaTac and in Enumclaw um, on the west flank of the Cascades. Um, how they are day by day through um, with uh, during a pretty hot summer of 2009. And that big peak there in the middle is when the previous record was set at um, SeaTac Airport in terms of um, maximum temperatures. And so um, as temperatures go up without more um, kind of regulation of the precursor chemicals, um, you know, we're liable to see ozone concentrations at at their peak uh, go up also. 
And I, I can show you more plots about, uh, you know, why we think global warming is going on. I think this, you know, makes the case as well as, um, as anything. Um, right. And so I, what I instead want to play, uh, you know, show how it's projected to play out around here. Yeah, it's going to get warmer, especially inland versus the coastal regions. This show uh, at the upper left is for the winter months, December through February, and um, lower right, the summer months. The ocean has a lot of thermal inertia, will kind of modulate the warming. It's warming up too, and actually taking up a majority of the heat in the climate system. But um, yeah, warming, um, especially in the interior. And uh, getting back to something I mentioned before, this idea that uh, more water when we don't need it as much, rainier winters or wetter winters and drier summers, even more of a Mediterranean climate than we presently enjoy. That you can't see the little numbers on there, but the increases in the winter from the climate models and looking at them as a group um, is greater than the decrease in, this, in the summer. It also means, um, you know, wetter British Columbia, that's the headwaters, the Colum uh, Columbia River. And so we're expecting actually increased overall flow in the, uh, the Columbia River. And so if your uh, customers rely on water from the Columbia project, um, probably do okay. In terms of temperatures, um, this, uh, this shows this kind of you know, something pulled out of Bozo the Clown's bathtub drain or something like that, is um, just an individual um, uh, climate model of simulations of what the temperatures are going to go uh, you know, projected to be over the next couple of decades. And here, this worst case scenario, the reds are the 8.5 scenario versus the best case, the blues, the 4.5. Uh, an important message here is that there's just still going to be variability from year to year. Different models are suggesting different kind of rates of warming. And notice that they really overlap for the next couple of decades. So what we do now doesn't determine so much what's gonna happen in the next 20 years. What it really determines is what's gonna to happen toward the end of the century. And this, from an, uh, from an economic point of view, that makes it really tough because if your benefits of doing something now are delayed, then it's like you can put it off. Oh, gas prices are so high. Oh, let's just you know put a hold on things here, and and so forth. Yeah. Um, what are winters? Uh, here, just um, focusing on Puget Sound. Uh, um, just thought these uh, figures were kind of attractive. That more precipitation, greater amounts in twenty four uh, in twenty four hour period. There, the kind of darker uh, greens. Atmospheric rivers, like um, the kind of, that's another term that's kind of come up in the, uh, the media and the people talk about. Um, the one that really hit Watcom, Skagit um, uh, counties this, this past winter, they're expected to increase um, somewhat in frequency just by, uh, uh, you know, the standards, what constitutes an atmospheric river now, but mostly in their intensity. The really strongest ones are just going to rain like hell, even more than they do now. And, um, and again, you know, if you look at the lower plots there, especially those kind of redder colors, especially as you get toward the end of the century in this 8.5 scenario. Heat waves, well, a shift in that distribution uh, on the left there is for land-based heat waves. You're kind of more focused on the marine environment. That variability, how wide that distribution of temperatures is, is much more narrow. But even with a smaller shift, you're going to be out there in the um, what constitutes a marine heat wave. And the top 1% of the temperatures is going to happen that much more often. Again, back to harmful algal blooms, it means the window of opportunity for uh, some of the, um, well, the species that cause these blooms. This one is for Alexandrium in the Puget Sound region for what it's worth is, um, is gonna be that much wider. It doesn't mean that there's always gonna be 
uh, harmful algal bloom there, but it just means the more opportunities. All right, we're almost there, hang tough. One thing that I, I'm personally kind of interested in, and the Climate Office is trying to uh, is get in, involved a little bit with, and I'm looking for you guys for you know possible partnerships, is how climate change could affect maybe not just human health, but um, agricultural pests too, through the vectors there. And in this case, um, one of them is West Nile virus. We get West Nile virus in the state. We've had a fatality. Um, and there are multiple cases, especially in Benton County, Yakima County in, in, the, in past years, about 20 people a, a year die in California now from West Nile virus. And basically the conditions are getting more favorable for the mosquito that, that carries this. From an agriculture point of view, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you uh, potato farmers deal with, but there's a BC, the potato psyllid. It's a little uh, bug that carries a bacterium that causes, uh, oh, I forget the name of the disease, I know, but a serious pest for potatoes. And it now overwinters south of here where it's warmer, it's too cold up here for it now. As the temperatures continue to warm, will it be able to move further north, be that much closer, and that much more, you know, infection? Okay. Now, admittedly, um, there can be some curveballs here, and the, uh, Mother Nature doesn't always play fair. And whether it's a, you know, in the face or you know, your pants down or whatever, you pick your metaphor. Uh, but we can have conditions like we've had this spring, or, you know, I mentioned February 2019 before, and that, when that happens, it doesn't mean this climate change is all a malarkey, but it just reflects the natural variability in the system. And um, see, I stole this unabashedly from the onion here, that, um, yeah, it's still, things are changing. So, you've been very patient. And I want to have a discussion both, you know, right now, and then you can call us up later and that sort of thing about, you know, the sort of things you care about and what kind of information you need. And so I'm just going to let you mostly read this yourself. We talked about the heat wave of 2021 and how extreme it was. The idea of minimum temperatures, especially are on the increase in terms of the number of hot nights and the overall trends there. We think the winters are going to get wetter. Haven't seen that everywhere yet. Some on the coast, I perhaps didn't know. We are seeing some, um, some more flooding on some watersheds. And um, with that, again, um, hopefully you'll have access to these slides. And if not, you know, we're easy to get a hold of. You make a legitimate request, we'll try to get back to you and get you what you want. If it's not legitimate, we'll tell you to buzz off and, you know, everybody's happy, right? And so with that, I appreciate, I'm flattered to be invited to, to come here and let's talk. So thank you. Please. So, Please. Here, Linda, we actually had 107. I have it on my phone. And later that year, we had five degrees before the North Easter wind. Yeah. I mean, this is like severe storms. Then we got great flood right after that. Yeah. So it's like it's been crazy. I mean, now it's just really moderate, but the swing was. The biggest I've ever seen. Yeah, and uh, so uh, a great point there about this, you know, the whipsaw and so forth. And a, a legitimate question is, are we getting those bigger swings? And it's actually um, really tough to tease out because it's, a, it's such a noisy data set. And to be really statistically sure, yeah, for damn sure, you know, that's definitely changing. There's some hints of that, but... Um, I'm not sure yet we've necessarily seen changes in overall weather patterns that are systematic enough and say, yeah, it's a, it's a different ballgame. Temperatures are rising. 
no question about that. But uh, you know, as storm tracks change and all that, yeah. Uh, so that's a kind of an admission of defeat. So thank you. Somebody else, please. Oh, don't be bashful. Yeah. Well, tornadoes seem to be a thing. I never remember that as a kid. Exactly. Terrified storms. Yeah. 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 Never heard about a tornado touching down. Where are you from? Okay. Yeah. Well, we do have tornadoes here. And in fact, it was in 1972 or 74, one of those years, um, that Washington State led the nation in tornado deaths. Uh, a, a big tornado went through Clark County, just north of Portland. And um, we do have uh, springtime. They tend to be not as severe. Now it's just, you know, the fluke of all time. But we do have, we do get those storms that occur in the spring when the conditions are just right. And if anything, what, again, a noisy data set, we're tending to, I'm tending to see fewer thunderstorms in spring, but maybe somewhat more in summer. And uh, it's the spring ones that um, that have uh, can produce tornadoes. And there have been some others in Western Washington in, um, oh, how many, I, there was a May a few years ago in which there was a, um, one uh, around Port Orchard, I think. And, um, yeah. And um, so, but um, a, a good question. And again, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hey. I just wanted to ask you to repeat your question. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, we were just talking about tornadoes, but yeah. too late now, right? <laughs> so, you brought up the wind. Okay, so you know, conservation districts, they came out of the death of the wind. The combination of the wind and the dry soil. So, you know, we've seen projections for sea level rise. We've seen some of the models that showed what wind has been doing. So, what is there any anticipation that that's? Yeah. So, the question was about wind and, um, and in particular as it relates to dust, which is a summer problem. Um, we have seen, uh, I've got a, a spectacular photo of a haboob uh, going across a dust storm across Ritzville some years ago. And um, so with drier summers, more dust, there's the chance for that to happen. And uh, what I need to do, and it's kind of on me, is to figure out, you know, just what are the trends there in the um, in the wind speeds in the maximum gusts and what are our, our climate models showing? And getting back to the dust is a serious thing. It's of course visibility for drivers and that sort of thing. But there's a fungus, valley fever, that is in dust that gets uh, it's endemic to the southwestern U.S. We're seeing it up here somewhat. And the idea that uh, it grows when it's wet in the winter soil dries out and the spores are then distributed in dust storms. And so if we're seeing more of that, that that's important from a human health perspective. Yes, please. So, you mentioned that you want to partner with conservation districts. Yeah. How do you envision this predictive modeling to benefit us? And what what do you envision for how do you communicate that to our constituents and Yeah, yeah. And so there um Great question, and uh, perhaps we'll be covering uh, things kind of related to that in the session that Bill's going to lead. I'm not sure which room at um, after the break in three. But um, what I envision is first a dialogue between the climate office and individuals like yourself with conservation districts about the sort of things you want to know more information on, and um, perhaps we can just provide data or to show you the tools for getting it yourself. Another thing, we'd be happy to uh, run workshops on the use of climate data. It turns out it's probably going to be going uh, to a, a group, um, a Department of Health, um, leading a workshop on how to, how to get some of this stuff. And so I guess the first step is just we have to find out your needs. 
because I can make up stuff that doesn't have much relevance to, <laughs> to what you need. And so that, that's the important first step and be happy to, you know, just try to initiate more of those conversations. Kind of along the same lines though, if, if, I mean, you're talking about things you can do to help us, which is really important. We need to understand that so we can also explain that to the people we work with. But yep. is there information that maybe we have or can get access to that can help you? Oh. Oh. I'm speaking on behalf of my friend. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. You don't want any extra work yourself. No. No. Yeah, you know, this, the question was, you know, what um, this is a two way street, and um, I'll give that some thought. And um, I'm kind of a slow thinker in general, and you know, so um, but that's a, that's a great question. I, you know, there is data, especially if there's any soil moisture data that going back or, or things, uh, maybe even uh, things like timing of certain emergence of uh, things and so forth that could kind of um, supplement some of the data sets that we already have kind of pretty good access and familiarity with. So that's just off the top of my head, but I'm not sure if that's... So, so, so for example, one of the things, I, I'm up in Ohio, so yep. one of the things we're working with some landowners to do, just a handful right now, but we're looking to expand it, tracking levels of just natural pumps ah. throughout different times of the year and over length of time. Yeah, so the, the comment there was about... Um, uh, tracking ponds and perhaps groundwater. And I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things that is kind of disturbing what's happening in the state is that groundwater is being mined in various places at unsustainable rates. And uh, there's a uh, kind of index well near the Davenport that even with this wet spring, the water levels are down lower than they used to be a few years ago. And so that kind of information to kind of supplement the stream flow measurements from USGS and so forth, that would be very interesting. So, um, yeah, um, I'm impressed. So, anyway, uh, anybody have some other ideas? Of, of other questions? You know, I'm anxious to get to the break. Um, <laughs> right, again, I'm going to be around the, the remainder of this afternoon. I'm going to um, you know, elbow my way into the dinner line too. And so I hopefully have a chance to have some conversations with you. Thanks again. Okay, yeah, I can see already uh, what, you're, what you're thinking about it. And maybe it's meshing through our technology and how do we get our data and process that and mesh it? Because we're in a new generation, right? So every, a lot of stuff's going to be online and tech people would zoom in. So we don't all have to drive, but it's nice. And we're happy we're here today, but see us connecting and getting our data and figuring out a local spot for that. So, because yeah, I can just see how it would help to present some of this stuff and, and vice versa and see how we can connect. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay.